Okay, so uh, Porch Studio sale is upcoming very soon. Please save your money and don't get it now. It's a bit more expensive than it will be after the sale. Um, during the sale, uh, the, br the brushes will also go on sale at the same time. I have around two big sales a year. Um, the last sale that was this big was back in October. I usually have one in um, September. I mean, uh, October, and I have one again in uh, the spring. Um, and um, yeah, and after that, the update will come out another massive overhaul update that boosts efficiency and boosts performance. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy the new update. I hope you guys enjoy the new content. Um, it will be a hand model and a bunch of other fabric models, I hope, um, if things work out. So uh, let's get started on the critique hours for today. So I am actually using Portrait Studio today to pose because this character doesn't feel like she's falling. It feels like she's in the middle of like this break dance kind of one leg in front of the other. It doesn't feel like she's falling um, as Alice would. Also, her head is very, very big. Um, and uh, it's just, it just feels a little bit off at times. So what I'm going to do is start off by kind of adjusting her features. Actually, I'll just start off by adjusting her legs because they seem to be too short. Okay. So this seems like a more appropriate size for her legs. Now they're a bit thick, but um, I can't really adjust too much. So before, after, they were very tiny, like her body belonged to someone else before. And the one really, really great trick to do um, to avoid this is to just do that hiding trick I showed you guys. Um, so you hide a certain part of the painting away and just work for a little while, keep doing your thing. Your brain will start adjusting and completing the lines of the picture on its own. Your brain will start doing its own thing. It'll find where it thinks the head will be. It'll just keep doing its thing. And then it'll eventually, um, when you unveil the part that you were having trouble with, you'll see how off it was. So before we do this, I'm actually going to pose it here so we can find a more believable falling, um, falling gesture. So what she did was her body was up. So let's start this. Let's see how we're gonna, how we're gonna do this, so. Okay, so the body was forward. Not so worried about the hands. The head was down. The torso, actually the body was more forward and the torso was back. And then I'm just going to rotate the whole thing. So now she feels like she's falling but only with, I'm just posing one thing at a time, and that's really the best way to pose. Pose one piece at a time as you're, as you're doing. So try to fit the torso in the, in, in the fall. Don't work on the legs yet. Don't work on the arms yet. These are all accessory, especially in someone suspended or falling, the torso usually decides. So usually when someone's falling, their chest goes instantly upward. Um, so I sometimes just perform the, uh, the pose myself so I can figure it out. And that's kind of what I'm going for here. And these markers are just helping me figure out what I need. And then what I'll do next are the arms. So a character that feels like this, these arms have been already corrected, but I'm just waiting for the update to, to kind of work on them. So if you're having issues posing the arms or they're not lining up, don't worry. So I'm just raising the shoulders. And then I'm just, the, the elbow is in front of the body, the arm is forward. <clears throat> so forward arm. And then out, elbow is in front. And then out again. All the way up. Okay. I'm 
just focusing on how the wrist is going to trail after. So I'm, I'm going for a whole, com a completely new pose. So the wrist trails after the arm, the shoulder is hunched up, um, and then the elbow is in front of the body. Um, so I can't really show you guys the pose I'm doing right now on my, on my table, but um, just to show you what I mean by the wrist trailing, a little something like this. And then it goes all the way up and out. Something like that. And I'll just, you know, keep keep trying to, you know, make it feel like there's one heavier piece that trails after the others. Um, so this is basic, this is really simple stuff with the arms. It's really what you do with the legs that's going to make it feel like a like an active pose, like she's about to land. And it's the legs where you had your main issues. Okay, so what I want to do, what I would want to do is uh, not make it too girly a pose, just something where someone is falling and it's more like a ballet thing. Um, and what we do with the legs with someone falling is kind of tuck in the shoulders. I mean, the, let me tuck in the shoulders first. And then move the arms back. She's looking down. And the legs, one leg will always try to land first. No one really tries to land with both legs. It's just one leg that'll land first. Both need to be bent at certain degrees, so I start there. I start with the bend, and then make her look at a certain direction while she's falling. And then sometimes the legs spread just a bit, opening the thighs and out. And then the other leg is the one that trails behind. It's about to land first. This one is also extremely bent. So again, we're just thinking about that Alice scene of someone falling. And then she seems to be losing control of everything. So she kind of just falls like that. And what I'm doing here is just continuing the feeling of arms trailing behind her torso. Okay, so if you feel like you need a forward haunch even more, you can try something like that and then push the body back so that she feels like she's really falling down. Um, you can also try to do something else with the hand if there's something else to be done. But the legs you drew were kind of way too straight. It felt like she was some, doing something deliberate with the straight leg. And when someone's falling, they're really just trying desperately to find some solid line. And that means the legs are just moving around. This would have been more of an organic pose for you to pursue. Uh, let me turn on the bounce light. Uh, because what that would have done is it would have made it feel a little bit more, uh, less trying to be deliberately angelic or deliberately graceful. And just this is graceful. This is a very graceful way to fall. Um, it looks clumsy because it's human, but there is a certain amount of human you need for a female falling. And there's the graceful that happens naturally. Um, so natural poses are graceful. Uh, write that back. And the reason why we have to find the natural pose first is because it's not specific to any gender. It's not specific to any age. Uh, emotion is emotion. Of course, when someone's older, they have a little bit less of a, of a um, you know, grace to them. They're more old, more hunched forward. Uh, but um, this, this kind of pose is the kind of pose I would have loved to see in, in, in kind of like an Alice character. She's not graceful or cute or girly in the way she's trying to fall. She'll fall like any guy would fall if she was falling from a distance downward. But in her dress and her hair is where all that girly comes back. So don't confuse characterization with natural organic movement, natural organic uh, movement. It's just, it does not feel right. It does not feel natural. So when someone falls like this to make it even more intense, go for something more courageous, more crazy. Uh, make the arms go all the way up. Kind of just really, really falling um, and really cascading or falling down. Maybe one leg will go all the way in front 
of the body. And you see what happens when you're capable of kind of figuring out um, how to pose this. You start thinking about camera. You start thinking about the angle of the camera. Um, let me see. So I think I have something else also to, that I want to change about the knee. Um, this, I'm going to just move this up. Just like that. But you had that straight knee before, uh, which is why I'm trying to work off what you did. Not not too closely either. Maybe neither leg, maybe it's a suspended, a more happy suspension. But this is just one frame of a larger movement. If you really, really want a proper reference, what we look for when we're trying to create such an active organic pose, you just you just go on YouTube, um, falling. Uh, let me see, falling from cliff, cliff, okay, so let's see what happens when, oh Jesus, um, that's not what I mean, um, let's see this one, uh, speed is very slow, okay, well, these guys are kind of, so I think this pose is really perfect, except it, it kind of, see how the legs are bent? Uh, both legs are bent. One arm is trailing behind. One arm is trying to find what to do. So which, when you're running, you're always running with one leg and one arm. It's usually one leg and one arm that lead the run, that lead the fall. Um, so she must have been falling. If she was falling for a while, it wouldn't really be easy for you to find a reference for. But this is definitely what I'm talking about one arm trailing behind, having a good amount of space between the legs. The person is trying to find something to hold on to, um, which is hard, of course, to, to, to do when you're, when you're falling and you have nothing to hold on to. So what happens is you start to struggle, and that struggle is what we're looking for in a natural pose. A natural pose is graceful, graceful in and of itself. This is graceful. It looks aggressive, but if you, as an artist, you have to start seeing like an artist. And it looks very, very graceful. Um, this girl's a chicken. She fell the funny way. Um, so cliff jump gone wrong. I don't want any gone wrong stuff, man. I don't want to get freaked out. Um, this is all some creepy shit. Okay. Let's try to find... Is this the gone wrong stuff? Is this gone wrong stuff? I really don't want anything gone wrong. Jumping, trampoline, trampoline. <coughs> um, okay. Oh, I hate people who just have stupid prank videos like this. Are they gonna have like a natural jump or not? Uh, let's try to find some more. Usually trampoline jumps are very, very, um, structured or not natural feeling. Okay, come on, lady. Yeah, it's not going to be what we want. Maybe that moment when she's kind of looking back, that would have been a good example. That single moment she's looking back. <clears throat> so let's take a look at it. And something like that with a straight leg, you rotate it up. This feels good, but the problem is she's falling down. That's why her arms trail in front of her. She was falling forward. The arms would trail behind her. Uh, but this is how I, this is the grueling task of finding references. Um, this is how, this is how we have to do it. Um, you have to be smart about it. You have to find an equivalent um, kind of reference to look for. It's not always what you think. Uh, it's usually like the somewhere in the middle of the jump is what you're trying to reference. I don't know why there's a video about two young girls jumping on a fucking trampoline. I, I really don't know what the deal is with that. Let me just... 
Well, it was, it was the second before. It was just right before this. And I promise you I'll be done with the reference looking. I don't even know if these are two young girls. Jesus, I don't know. So these both legs are symmetrical. You want something a little bit more unstable. Okay. And now they're just doing tricks. Okay. Um, so what did we learn out of this? The arms should be a little bit more strong, more raised, trailing behind. You can only figure that out when you're looking from the side. Always move around your camera. Never try to pose while your camera is in one position. Just like how when you sculpt, you want to pose. This feels much more natural. Very nice. And then, yeah, you always want to pose with your eye on, on different angles. Don't try to pull this off with one static camera. Even though you're going to be taking a picture from one angle, you want to move around your camera. I mean, why would you just stay in one position? And I've seen this way too much, especially for students that have Portrait Studio and work with me in class. Um, and, and I see how they use it, and I ask, okay, use it in front of me. Let's see what you're doing. They don't move their camera. It's just still, just like, you know, a beginner sculptor wouldn't move the camera that much. You got to move it around. You got to see from different angles. The light hides some stuff sometimes. Um, I feel like the torso could be a little bit more just trailing behind, and then the body can feel a little bit more forward. Now the legs seem a little bit too similar to each other, so let's try to straighten it back to the original pose. And then this one could be the leading leg. This one could be the trailing leg, and the leading leg is the one with the foot pointing down. Remember that. It's the one that's ready to land first. And then you choose your camera. Maybe this leg rotates out just like that. Okay. So that's kind of what I'm looking for in the legs, this exact kind of space in between. Um, this kind of openness in the arms. Uh, this this arm here could, could uh, possibly rotate out. be a little bit more open or maybe even uh, trail backward even more just like that okay so let's take a look again at what you did here and you see how large the body is so you're looking at the legs and you just see the body is very large and these are the new legs which kind of fit the body. Oops. So, we got to take those up. Connect all this. So you see how the legs feel very like like um I I wish I could search up a break dancing video, but the low arm, the straight leg, nothing really actually feels like she's falling. She feels like she's sliding down some rock more than falling suspended for for a long time. I remember reading it, she just felt like she was falling forever until finally she landed. Um, so it's not a slide so much as a straight fall down. And you need a little bit more of an open motion. So let's try to match this angle. You need more of an open motion. Um, even if the arm itself might, might have very, very little activity to it, so we're completely disabling the hands disabling the arms, just the legs, just look at the legs alone. Do whatever you want with the hands. Maybe she was holding something, maybe she grabbed hold of a twig on her way down, but the legs alone should have a bit more instability. Here they feel like she's just doing some parkour and she landed on a surface, okay? So that's my biggest critique for, with this. I'm gonna move on to this. This one is more lighting than anything, um, so. I hope that helped you. Let's talk about this. So the person here had a lot of trouble with almost everything. Um, it feels very stale. It feels too clean. 
And I'm just going to get my smudge brush and just go crazy. Also, the background color is, I need to separate it completely from the painting because, oops, because what you've done here is kind of make it feel like it's a vector drawing. It doesn't feel like a, you know, an actual kind of illustration. He also had a gradient behind him. So I'm just going to give him a different sky color behind him. More something with green. See how instant the change is? Because that green now accepts the yellow that's behind it. Green and yellow kind of work together. And what happens is the, the yellow of the sun mixes with the blue in the background, which is explains the yellow in the feathers and the white in the feathers, and then bringing in that green-ishness to the blue. It's, it's kind of closer to green than it is to purple, so this is more of a green-blue. Um, allows it to feel like a natural sky. So I'm going to just raise this up to son of a... It's all wrong. Okay, I'm just getting rid of those blues. Next up, we have to cool down anything that isn't looking at the sun. So how do you cool down a yellow? You just desaturate it first. That's like the best way to desaturate it. And then you guys will see the before and after. So we're cooling down anything that is not touched by the light. I'm also going to start smudging away. Try to make the feathers feel more natural, more messy less perfect. I mean, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of feathers that are very, very low density just hanging off the edges. So what I'm doing here is just making it feel a little bit messy, less like a vector drawing or some sort of logo drawing and more like an illustration. An illustration is painterly. It has more of an active brush stroke to it and less like a clean distinction between every component. And this grayscaling here of anything that the light doesn't touch is really starting to help. Another way to cool down the yellow is just to move into purples, just straight into purples so we no longer even have a yellow. Um, and if there are whites, if, th if this character, if this creature is white in any way, that white will take on the full color of that shadow area, which means we will actually see purples in that white. So white takes on the environment colors. I uh, write that back. So white inherits environment colors. So I'm just throwing some of that purple right in there on anything that's white. It's not so much purple. I'm going to bring in some of the blue from the background as well. It's just more of an environment color mix, like a little cocktail of all the colors in the environment. And then what I'm going to do is get Dodge Tool on highlights and I'm allowing dodge tool because this is just white it's a white object and I'm going to choose where the hot spot is for all the subsurface scattering it's going to be all around the object here all around the rim this is the pure nature of the light source sitting underneath the surface of the feathers so there's going to be a lot of white a lot of yellow a lot of strong values and a lot of shape loss because the 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 subsurface is so strong, we're losing some of the shape in the feathers, which is why it was so problematic for you to have so much distinction between each feather. You really needed more of a blur. It's not just a motion blur, it's just the fact that the feathers are, are experiencing so much drenching light. And I'm just smudging all and blurring all across. I'm going to get my sponge tool and desaturate into some whites. You don't need much yellow for yellow to pop. You don't need a lot of yellow. And you need more white than yellow for universal light source. You can also write that back. And then now we've got to smudge the shadow, which is probably the silhouette of the boniest, deepest, uh, like highest density part of the feather, the most opaque part. And this was probably the most sterile part of the painting, I think. It just didn't have enough of a reflection of the texture from which it's emerging. 
first thing we did was change the background color. That was the most important thing. Next I'm going to do that distortion um, as light travels underneath. There is a certain distortion that it causes just around here. I might have to get the old layer back. Really just depends on where the light source is coming from. If the light source is directly behind, we grab a light source color, which is more yellow, more white than yellow, but definitely yellow in there, and we're throwing it behind as one big you know, something to say that the sun is behind the character. And I'm just going to move him up a little bit, a bit more centered. Kind of keep getting rid of that yellow. It's too much yellow. There's a lot, you know, more, more white than yellow. And just keep smudging. That's a lot of feathers. It's the illusion of the texture, not the actual texture. <clears throat> and keep doing this. Then there's going to be a lot more instances, again, where the light comes through and floods the area. Just like that. And you can see how nice the white is, but the yellow is just so extensive. Get way too much yellow. I'm just going to actually desaturate a little bit. It's crazy how, because we desaturated, things look realistic. You'd think there was more color variety in the real world, but there isn't. The eyes can only do so much and process so much. It's always about subtlety and the illusion of the detail. Okay, so again, we're finding another hot spot, and that's this whole ring around, just like that. And then what I'm going to do is get smudge tool on some kind of scatter brush um, that's not a smudge brush. So something that I can scatter, maybe this cloud brush here, so I can get that edge to look like actual feathers. I'm just going to use that like everywhere. And don't be afraid if you lost the rim. It's not about the rim. It's about it's about the rim being barely there. The rim of the subsurface scattering around the feathers being bar barely there. So this is a good way to start a painting. It's I'm going to just throw some subsurface in here and then scatter um, some... Uh, saturation. So the way you started the painting was good just as a way to lay down your values, but I don't think it was a good idea to to do it so, so sterile. It just looked like you got some alcohol and you just sterilized your painting. So I'm saturating in the shadowed areas. That's what subsurface is. And just around here. See how pretty that is? I'm just going to continue smudging. Thank you, Hamish. And it's all about balancing how much mid-tone you have left with the rim of the light that's coming through. So it's a silhouette, but it's a silhouette through a piece of white fabric. That's what this uh, dude is, this little, this little messenger. And I'm just going to throw some more on the edges. Again, the white, the reason why we ask students to avoid using white on everything is because white floods out detail. But if you're in a silhouette and you got feathers, flooding out detail is exactly what you should be doing. The thing is, the problem with this is tricky because you're trying to look at look at this. Let, let me show you this. This is one possibility for us to, to pursue. Turning the whole feather into a silhouette. Let's take a look. And leaving only the outlines as bright. This still works. If the object is heavy enough, if it's a, um, if it's a, if it's a type of feather that, that is thick enough, if it's a different kind of bird, I guess we can go halfway, but that's just another way to do it. It's hard to tell what you were doing with these, and I'm just trying to make them match. Um, what we might do is just extend some of the feathers out. This is some real rendering I have to do to make the point, but I don't mind. Okay. It's all about layers. Apply the conditions of light as layers. Leave behind um, subsurface and bounce light for later, and focus on the most immediate condition of the light source first. And the most immediate here is the silhouette. What kind of light environment am I dealing with is the question that you ask. 
don't know if you guys can hear the rainstorm outside. I'm so sorry if I disconnect. There's a big storm here. And I'm just going to smudge upward. I think I need a hundred. Okay, this is very tricky. So it's not a lot of work to know, to do. It's not a lot of work, it's a lot of knowledge. Do you know what I mean? It, the, the work itself, it, they don't have a lot of choices to make once you know what the, the knowledge is, right? So write that back. It's not a lot of work, it's a lot of knowledge. If you get the knowledge done with a bunch of stupid ass studies that you can get out of your way and finally put behind you, the process isn't a long process for painting. because I'm doing this right in front of you. Okay, I'm just going to shift the kind of yellow this is into something a little bit more cool. So, so not this and not warm. Just something a little bit more towards that and then desaturate one more time. Something a little bit more golden. So this is where it started off. It's actually pretty good where it started off, but I want it to be a little bit more friendly. As for the red, I'm just going to go ahead and desaturate that. Oops, the red has an opportunity for a lot of subsurface. You need to cool down the feathers. I'm going to use Dodge Tool. Wherever we have some moments of illumination, and I'm going to cast the shadows of the feathers on, the, on this dude. I'm also going to cast the shadow of the owl onto the scroll and I'm going to cast the shadow of the feathers, the tail feathers, onto the foot, relieving only the end of the foot. So how are we going to do this? Okay, so we're going to start over here. Alright, so we're tracking down some cast shadows. Shit, I didn't do this right. And then we're tracking down this. Casting the shadow of the body on the scroll. And then getting rid of all of this extra rim light, because how would that sun get there? please. And then I'm just going to deselect now. So I try not to do as, as many of these as, I try not to do these as much as possible because they tend to take up the whole class. But I like having full on paint overs like this from time to time. Okay, so this is going to get awkward because it seems to be ending on a tangent. So I'm going to extend this even lower and locking this layer I'm going to just mess with these tail feathers as well. Okay, and then I'm going to fix this little mess. Just fake some feathers in here. And this shadow, I'm going to clean that up a little. You don't you just don't need a pure black in all this red, you do not. I'm gonna grab some of the yellow in the feathers of the um, bird, which is the yellow of the sun. And I'm just throwing that on top. And that should have just unified everything nicely. Okay, and then I'm going to saturate anywhere where we have some sunlight. Sun feeds color, write that back. Just extend that out. It's reaching all the way out. Might as well just get some more. So if you have any questions, get them ready. Throwing some more of that yellow. 
through the feathers. I really think the feathers are a little awkward. That spike of red, of red is just kind of throwing off the, the object. So now that we've set the stage, we've taken all of that stuff out of the way, I really, really think you need to pick up a good reference for the bird and just just work on some of the internal details. So the beak and is this a barn owl? This is a barn owl. So let me get a good reference for a barn owl. Fourth kind owl permanently lodged in my brain. <clears throat> um, why can't you view image anymore on Google? What the fuck? I'm sorry. What the hell is all that about? What's, what is that about? Um, okay, so there's an indentation of the eyeballs in the external bed. Feathers just around here, so that's going to bring in some detail points. Um, there's a feathering, like a, a, a halo of feathers moving out, so raise this all the way to 100. Oopsie. And just um, continue that. And this is going to give us some detail points because everything was framing the face, everything. And uh, there was nothing really there being framed. All right, so see how you can have a ring around the, 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 the whatever it is. You can have detail. You can have the feathers, but it has to be a little bit more natural, organic, uneven. Nothing is this clean in the real world. And that's why the word sterile was all that kind of popped in my head. And because this is the ring, the, 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 the initial flame, I mean frame, I am going to... It's funny, I think flame every time I touch dodge tool. I'm just going to throw some of that in there. And then there's a ring of saturation right underneath that. Let me show you. A ring of saturation right underneath, just here. Only on the brightest spots, not everywhere. Okay. You can throw some lens flares if you want, some crazy ass lens flares. Um, this yellow, I mean, this red is really bothering me, but these are your choices. I'm just going to go back to smudge tool and try to figure out some more. Um, I'm going to throw in some like highlighter bits. So I'm going to choose a brighter color for this region. Just, just around here. Just something internal, just some internal detail. Just raising the detail here. Just anything to give this more intrigue. I don't want to interrupt the cast shadow color though. I don't want to interrupt the core shadow, the, which is the silhouette in this case. And I'm just going to get my scatter smudge and just continue with this. No, that was good detail just now. Lowering the strength. Lower the strength all the way if you're using any of my smudge brushes. Um, they're extremely strong. So any questions uh, for a painting where you could see a lot of the sky, like a landscape or something, what would be ways to avoid making the sky look like a PowerPoint gradient? Not having a gradient at all. You're so close in the sky, you're not far away enough in the horizon to see the gradient of, this, of the hemisphere and the position of the sun. Just have it one solid color. What did I do with this? I just had one solid color. That's it. That's how you not make it look like one of those gradients. Last thing I'm going to do is just use shadows and just darken anything that is a bit more dense. So the body of the bird uh, should be a bit more dense. I'm also going to get rid of any of these yucky lines. You had a good start where you were with your subsurface scattering. You had a good idea, but you were way too sterile. But you were in a good position to start blending. So you see, this is possible because you were in that good of position. Um, so. It's nice to start sterile and set up your values, but 
that's not that's not the end game. That's not what it's all about. Just because I like subsurface, I'm just going to go a little bit more crazy. Just a bit more. And I'm going to saturate. Mm, look at that. Yummy. And then using my studge tool on my blocking brush, my number four, very low strength. I'm going to try to throw in those little explosions of feathers just caught in the light. Oh, mama. Just 1%. 1% should be. Not 2%. Yeah, 2% was good. And these are strategic. These are the last little bits. You got to zoom out and assess. They can't be even. They can't be evenly across each other. And is there more space for subsurface? I think so. Um, let's try. Subsurface scattering, I made a whole video about it. You can look in my video history. The key to subsurface scattering is saturate and illuminate. And the saturation only exists in the shadows. That's the only way you can tell that there's subsurface, if it's dark enough already to show it. If it's an area that's already illuminated, there's a lot of subsurface here. But because there's so much, there isn't one area that is subsurface. Okay, so I hope this was helpful for you. I'm just going to go ahead and desaturate one more time. So even this still looks good. And it's minus 41 points. Okay. So I'm going to let's change the sky color and just see how wrong every other color is. So this is like that perfect blue color. It's plus 10. This is a little bit more green. This is a bit more purple, and this is where we started off. Because we based all of our current colors on that light environment. We can't just shift it. Um, right, this is whiter, which still works. Actually, I like this one. It's just a bit too white. I like the presence of the sky. Um, I'll make it a bit whiter. All right, let's just take a look at the before. I recommend, like, let me just show you now that I've smudged everything. I mean, blurred, uh, blended everything. I recommend something like this, where you have like real changes in the surface. Just stuff like that, you know, like a little less clean. Just make it messy. Um, and go in there and blend and mess up again and blend and mess up. But um, I hope this was helpful for you. Or after. Any questions? Let me just lower the levels. I think that's going to be more fun. No, never mind. It's an angelic scene. You can't have too many dark valleys. Uh, for Google, to view image, right click, open image, and new tab. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Open a new tab. Oh, see, it opens the. It opens the website, which is not what I'm asking for here. Open a new tab. It opens the source. I don't know why it's been doing that. Why doesn't it just give us the source itself? I have to go to the source now. Why did you Google do that? There used to be a view image. God, you had one job, Google. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Dev. Dev. Should I do a 14-day challenge right away, or should I do form studies? <laughs> okay. Um, all the 14-day challenge questions are available on my website. If you don't know what to do with your 14... I'm going to read other questions pertaining to this, but if you don't... Uh, did I lose my internet again? Yeah, this has been happening all day. Um, if you don't know what to do with your 14-day challenge, just start to scroll down on the community tab on my website. There's a whole Q&A on... FAQ and Q&A on the 14-day challenge. Please read it there. Uh, it's open image and new tab, not link. Oh, okay, let me try that again. Omit, open image and new tab. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, thank you, guys. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, uh, for me personally, even with all this help this painting is getting from Isarak, it's still very boring to look at. 
Um, you could have some, I'm not, I'm really not, I don't know how to help you. Uh, so I think it's pretty good as it is if there's a title, if there's another character, if there's something a little bit more to do with the, like the, the, the scroll, if you're under the scroll a little bit more, if you have more like armor on the bird, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I think it's good as it is to dress it up with more. I don't think you should do anything else to the bird to make the painting more interesting because then you're going to overdo the bird and it's not gonna, no longer going to be a bird. A smaller frame, yeah. Um, uh, is to do value scale useful to learn light theory or are they two different things? If so, which one should I focus first? Um, what do you mean by value scale? Is gradient another form of symbolic painting maybe? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've talked about how students flatten the image and then paint from dark to light from one edge to another, from one line or one part of the painting to another. Um, yeah, yeah, just because you blended and just because you made a, a, a gradient doesn't mean you rendered anything. Uh, radi a gradient is a denominator of a, a denomination of radial shading and radial shading is form and building on 3d axis so it's not yeah you're right it's a form of symbolic painting type <clears throat> um uh, scroll up they removed it because of getty images suing but you can add it back with a plugin. Um, what? Stupid Getty images. What the hell did they sue for and why did Google get intimidated? I read that Google did that so it can be more difficult to steal copyright images. Um, oh, that bar with the black on point on one point and white on the other and all the grays in between. Um, you mean you're just studying gradients? No. I, I don't, I don't think that's good to study gradients. I think you should, I really don't know what you mean like on, a, on an object. If you're not studying forms, I'm not sure what you're studying. So, um, uh, anyway, um, it seems like all the questions are done. So, um, I hope this was helpful, helpful, helpful for you. Where you were before was just a little bit off and stale and too safe. Um, try to work from real references so you can pick up real atmospheres. It really feels like there's an air here now, more radiant sun, more dressed up with um, atmosphere and all the colors are matching each other. Before your yellow was yellow and it wasn't almost yellow. You want almost yellow. Everything is almost in the real world. Um, to join our class and to submit stuff in the Google Plus community, just press on, um, go to israq.com and click on the little Google Plus icon right here. Read the rules, please, please, please. And um, if you want to support on Patreon, you can. Um, as a watcher, or as an apprentice, the new month has started. Uh, you might miss this month's cycle, but if you get in early, you might catch it if you join today. Uh, the problem with Patreon is that they still haven't implemented or given me a pay up front option, which means that those who subscribe today after the first are not given their rewards until the next month. Um, some people have found a workaround. Some people use PayPal for those who come in late. I really think that shouldn't be my job. I shouldn't be facilitating. Patreon is the facilitator between me and my viewers, me and my students and fans. I shouldn't be the one accepting or asking for payment. kind of just feels so wrong. It's not me really the one who, who started Patreon. So not sure how to get them to hurry the hell up so that everyone just get the content and I don't have to delete for those who sample. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, the apprentice, uh, uh, what's it called? The apprentice tier is, uh, gets you into our discord where we have all kinds of critique hours, two hour critique hours, uh, sessions once a month, assignments that I'll be assigning very soon. All the reward system goes, uh, through discord as well for those who need it. Um, you get all the brushes I use in the week, uh, and in the month for any of my personal work, you get PSDs, you get a lesson, a video lesson of the painting that is the word for that month. You just get all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in that, but if you want to be a, a watcher just to support the community, you can also do that on Patreon. My goal is a thousand patrons. 
I repeat this every class. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very distant goal, but I hope it is um, possible within a couple of years. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you everyone for joining. Portrait Studio sale is upcoming for the spring and the Portrait Studio overhaul update is also upcoming, which will have hand models and a lot more variety. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. I will see you guys on two, Tuesday the 6th and um, sometime around April 1st, I mean sometimes around, sometime around it, last week of April and May 1st, that those weeks I will be taking a vacation. Um, probably be a two to three week vacation. Um, might, might stay in the U.S., might leave the U.S., I don't know. I want to leave permanently, <laughs> uh, but um, we'll see. But I'm just letting you guys know there will be a three-week massive break coming up uh, in two months. Uh, so I might have you guys work on a, an assignment during the break so you guys have something to do. I might have an assignment right beforehand. If, if I'll just let you guys know. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Bye.